I hope you guys have learned something. I heard that uh, the discussions went well. I'm glad. I hope you guys learned something. And obviously, the goal is to be the good soil. And we're going to be talking about what it means to be a good soil. But more importantly, uh, in the parable, we're talking about how to produce fruits. And that's what we're going to be talking about for the next several minutes. So I ask everybody to gather your thoughts, open up your hearts, put your phones away, and get ready to hear the Word of God and listen to what He has to tell us today. Today's lesson is titled, Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Anyone with ears to hear should listen and understand. Before I go into the sermon, I'm going to ask you guys a question. Imagine if you were given the opportunity to stand before God today, right now. You were able to thank Him for all the things that He has done for you in your life. What are the top three things you would thank Him for? Like, write it down. Like, actually, write it down. Oh, yeah. <laughs> write it down. We said, if you were given the opportunity to stand before God and thank Him for all the things that He's done for you from the beginning, from the time that you were born until today, think about all the things He's done for you. What are the top three things you would say? Now, look at your list. Look at your list. How many of you put down, I want to thank God because he has died for me? Don't raise your hand. Don't raise your hand. I want to thank him for sending his begotten son, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, to die for me on the cross. How many of us wrote that down? St. Paul says the following If Christ has not been risen, then all our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 14. If Christ has not been risen, which applies, he didn't die, he wasn't crucified. If our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, was put on the cross, and he didn't die for us, and if he didn't resurrect for us, and if he didn't ascend to the kingdom of heaven for us, then all our preaching is useless and your faith is useless. There is no Christianity without the belief of Christ being resurrected. Our entire faith centers around this message. What does the gospel mean then? What is it? The news is that Christ died for you. The news is Christ resurrected. The news is that through Christ's resurrection, we were able to get access to the kingdom of heaven. Whether we take it on, it's up to us. How many of us think about this? Of course, this is the centerpiece of Christianity. This is why we are Christians. This is why we pray. This is why we come to church. This is why clergy members do liturgy. This is why we read our Bible. This is why we do what we do. But how many of us give it enough time to think about this reality? Christ has died for you and me. This center piece of our faith was so important for our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. He went on to tell a parable about it in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 13, telling us, if you have ears to hear, listen and understand. It's not enough to listen, but also understand what I'm telling you. There is a farmer, he goes to the farm. He takes the seed and scatters it, lies on four different types of soils. The farmer symbolizes a conduit, a form that we get our message of Christ from. The seed is the message, and of course, the message is that Christ has died for you. The soil is us, our hearts. The fruits is how you will respond to the message Christ 
has died for you. How have we responded? In our life, what have we done as Christians that shows that we're Christians? Christianity is a title. We are Christians. That's our title. How do our actions resemble our title? I'll give you guys an example. I'm a student. I'm a full-time student. As a student, I have to study. As a student, I have to take exams. As a student, I have to do my homework. As a student, I'm broke. As a student, I took a lot of school loans to get me through my school career. That's what students do. My actions reflect my title being a student. We call ourselves Christians. How do our actions show our title? I was asked a question a long time ago that really changed my perspective on Christianity. If your neighbor happened to be uh, deaf, couldn't hear a thing, and all he could do was see how you acted and behaved as you came in and out of the house, and how you interacted with your friends, how you acted like before you went to work, before you went to school, how you came back on the evenings and the mornings, so on and so forth. With your neighbor who can't hear anything, just by looking at your actions, be able to determine that you were a Christian. Just by your actions looking at you, will he be able to know that you're a Christian? This question I really got. There. What have we done as Christians, as throughout our actions, to show that we are Christians? And of course, I'm not only talking about things like prayer, things like fasting, things like reading your Bible. Of course, these things are traits of being a Christian. They're very important. We have to pray. We have to fast. We have to read our Bible. But it's not limited to this. Christianity is not limited to us just praying. It's not limited to us just fasting. It's not limited to us just reading our Bible. Christianity, and especially when we talk about producing fruits, is the ability to benefit others. A prayer, fasting, reading your Bible, they're great things, traits of Christianity, but there are things that are going to help you out and you all. They're so important. That even the secular world performs these deeds under the alien state of meditation. Meditation, I mean, you cross your legs, so you're, you know, like, alright, call it whatever you want. You pray. Fasting, anything, I'm a vegan, healthy eat. You know, take pictures, post it online. I'm a vegan, we wait. You call it fasting. The Bible book has self help books. How do I do this in 98 steps? That's reading your Bible. Even the secular world has understood the powerful nature of things like meditation, which we call prayer, things that we call fasting, and things like reading our Bible. Even the secular world has figured these are important things for you. That alone is not enough to show your Christianity. I'm talking about actions that reflect your true Christian deeds. Things that benefit others. Things like feeding the hungry. Things like visiting the sick. Things like paying off our school loans. But that's besides the point. All Christian needs. So which really shows the fact that we are Christians? How do we respond to the news that Christ has died for you and me? How do we respond to this? What should we do? And what? The seed fell on the soil, the good soil, and it produced fruits. Okay. We hear the message that Christ died for us, and then what comes next? Well, when we hear this message, in order to fully understand it, we have to answer the question, why did Christ die for Why was it important that our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, died for me? We say it all the time. We chant it, we pray it, it is centered around the Bible. But why did 
he do that? How is it related to me? Where am I in this picture of the message that Christ died for? Why should I? I'm just here living my life. To understand this, we have to go back and review the book of Genesis. We read in the first chapter of the story about Adam and Eve who ate a fruit that they were told not to eat, forbidden fruit. And as a result, they're kicked out of the Garden of Eden. You know, the first time I heard the story, I was like, I doubt. Eve, why must you guys ruin it for the rest of the world? Only if you knew not to eat the forbidden fruit, we could have been up there during our life. They ruined it for everybody. But the reality, if we're honest, today is a day of honesty. Adam and Eve symbolized and they reflected the true identity of humanity. Adam and Eve show and all the characters in the Bible, it's not just a historical book. Of course it's historical, but it's not just a historical book. It is also there to show and reflect our true nature as we are reading the Bible, as we are reading the story of Adam and Hewa, I should be seeing myself in the... Let me show you. Let me give you guys a uh, story. True story. First, just human beings in general, we have this tendency to want things that we are not able to have. This is just a natural tendency. So human beings in general have a tendency to get to want things that we don't have. Human beings, like if we're told not to have it, we want it even more. I'll give you guys a true story. True story. A long time ago, this guy, my oh, brother, oh, I'm going to pick on you out there. He's very mean to me. He's my older brother. He used to pick on me, do little things that he thought was funny. I didn't think it was funny at all. And I remember one particular day, we were sitting outside in Bully. Oh, yeah, we were rich. <laughs> <laughs> right. We were sitting on a porch, and then there were like, I remember there were two chairs outside. I don't know if you remember this. You were mean. You're very mean. <laughs> and one of the chairs, like, it was huge. It was a big chair. It was like real, real big. And I was sitting on it. It was like one of those like really comfy chairs. The other one, it wasn't even a chair. It was like a stool. It was just like some small like item. Keeps it. So after some time, He's like, hey, can we switch? And I'm like, no, why would we do that? And he listens to me, he's like, oh, okay, I mean, because this is the better one. And I'm like, how, how is that better? He's like, well, look, is, yours is just a chair. But me, look what I can do. He like flips around the stool and picks it up. He's like, I can play with it, I can roll it, I'm having so much fun. He's like, never mind, never mind, I can't switch with me, never mind. And I'm looking at it and I'm thinking, I'm like, I want the cool chair. He's like, I can't give it up now. I'm having too much fun. I can't even hear you. And I'm getting so excited. I'm like, no, please. And he's like, because you're my brother, I'll do this for you. And he switches. Now he's on the big chair. I'm on the small chair. Now as I'm trying to lift it, I realize very fast that it's not that fun. Now my brother at the same time, he goes, ooh, this is comfortable. <laughs> Oh, that was kind of killing me up. I'm having a great time. I'm like, please, let's switch. But we switch. We switch back. We switch back. We do this all day. Why? It's a manifestation of the fact that human beings in general, we want things that we don't have. When Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, the forbidden fruit, we ate the forbidden fruit. That is our nature. That's what we do. We want things that we don't have. I'll give our prove it to you. When Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit, God said, Do you guys really want to eat? Because I told you not to eat. If you're eating, if you really want to eat, here's my flesh, here's my blood, eat it and drink it. Every Sunday we come here and we say, No, we don't eat. Back then it was eat, or back then it was don't eat. Don't eat. It's like, No, 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 we gotta eat. Now it's eat my flesh, drink my blood. No, 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 we don't want to eat, we don't want to drink. Why do we do the opposite of what we're told? This is just a natural 
human being is. But Adam and Eve ate the forbidden fruit. We ate the forbidden fruit. We did that. Then we were kicked out of the Garden of Eden. We were sent to a place called Hades. We were sent to a place called Hades. Hades is a place where God's glory is absent. What I mean by God's glory are things like love, joy, happiness. These things are characterized as the glory of God. And in heaven, that is a place where we can see the glory of God to the fullest. In popular media, you see like hell and Hades being depicted as this place of like fire and like the devil having like this like tail and I don't even know what that's about. They have like two thorns and like ugly creature and all. You guys know what I'm talking about? You guys know what I'm talking about? That is not the devil. I don't know, I don't know who that is, but that's not the devil. The devil is not that scary. The devil's handsome. The devil is beautiful. The devil is attractive. If the devil wasn't attractive, and you look that ugly, who is wrong? No one. <laughs> who would be like, if that ugly creature came and said, oh, I don't mean, like, nah, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> who who is wrong? The devil is handsome, and he's attractive. But once he captures you, he takes away all the glory, and all the happiness, and all the joy that God has to offer you. In this world, that's what we do. We seek joy. We think. We think that we are seeking a new job. We think that's what we want. But really, we think the job is going to give us happiness. We think we want the new shoes. But the shoes may not give us happiness. We think we want the car. Because the car, we think, is going to give us happiness. What we truly seek for in this world is joy and happiness. But when it comes to God, we kind of like forget about that. And a whole attitude about Christianity is very off. Very off. I'll explain what I mean. So the question, the question that I get a lot of the time is, is it a sin to fill in a blank? Is it a sin to fill in a blank? If this is the wrong way to think about Christianity, and I'll explain why. Because like sin are things that upset God. Right? So what we're really asking is. Would God mad, get mad at me if I do this? But that's a wrong way to approach a relationship. Let me ask the girls a question. If your boyfriend, whatever, comes up to you and says, like, as long as you're not angry, or if he says, as long as you're happy, which one would you be like, uh uh-huh, uh uh-huh, to? Which one would you be like, <laughs> Which one would you do that to? Is it as long as you're not angry or is it as long as you're happy? Happy. So every time we're asking, we're worried about is it a sin for me to party? Is it a sin to drink? Is it a sin to drink at a party? Is it like all these questions are like missing the target? That is not the way to approach Christianity. The way to approach Christianity is is it righteous to fill the blank? Now we're asking about how I can get right with God. But every time I'm thinking about like ways to avoid hell, I'm missing the point. We should be here seeking the kingdom of heaven, knowing that that's where I can spend my time with God with, not avoiding some ugly creature. Does that make sense? Does that make sense? So we were sent into Hades. We were in darkness. We were full of sadness because the absence of happiness and joy is sadness. We were in darkness. And God, God, sitting on his throne, living in paradise, saw that we were living in darkness. And he wanted to come and rescue us. He wanted to come and save us. John, the gospel writer, didn't 
didn't know how to describe this phenomenon. He didn't know how to tell this love that God has for us. So he simply said, there is no greater love than this, that one would lay down his own life for his friends. He said, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son so that whoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. There is like no greater life love than this. John didn't know how to even describe the relationship that God has with us and how much he loves us. The Bible also lets us know by using the symbolism of a husband and a wife to help us just a little bit understand just how much that God loves us. And symbolism that it uses is the relationship between a husband and a wife. You guys read the Bible a lot of the time? The relationship between a husband and a wife is used to help us understand the relationship God has with the church. The church being us. The church being us. And in this example, if we used, if we push this metaphor a little bit more, it would be as if, it would be as if, like a husband and a wife are married for seven years, happily married. And the wife comes to the husband one day and says, I'm leaving you. I'm leaving you. Not only am I leaving you, I'm cheating on you. And I'm leaving. Fuck. She leaves. How do you think a husband would feel? That, that, that in itself is like enough for a movie. Like that's an entire movie right there. But the story moves on. The story moves on. Then, this like cheater wife goes off with her new friend or whatever you want to call her. And the friend ends up being evil. He captures her. He ties her up. He puts her in a cage in a dungeon somewhere and leaves her. And if the girl somehow got her hand on her phone and called her husband and said, come rescue me. But you need to pay a million dollars of ransom to come and save me. What do you think the husband would do? I would say, ha, 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 sounds like a personal problem. <laughs> and he's good, and he's a good person. The best that he would do is alert the authorities and say, there's a horrible human being. I think she's in danger. I don't really know. I did my part, do whatever you want. So in that example, in that example, no husband would do anything for her. Right? But what if he kind of decided to sell all his possession? To sell his car, to raise the million dollars, and goes to save this girl who just told him she didn't want to be with him. Does that make any sense? No. No, not at all, right? We're in agreement here. God, we were in a relationship with God. And the God of Eden, He gives everything. After seven years, we just got up one day and said, We don't want you at all. The minute we, Adam and Eve, represent humanity. The minute that we ate the forbidden food and heard the advice of the devil over God, we were telling God we want to break up. We no longer want to be with you. We prefer the devil. We prefer to be in a relationship with him. We rejected God and went on to the devil. It didn't stop there. We were full of darkness. The devil tied us up. He showed his true identity. And God in the kingdom of heaven was looking down saying, I'm not going to sell my house. I'm going to leave my paradise. This is the king. He left his kingdom. He left his throne. Surrounded by holy holies, all the angels, seraphim, and cubic. All of them surrounding him, calling him holy, holy, holy is your name. That is what he left to come and look for me and you. There is no greater love than this. There is no greater love than this. For no one will do such a thing. But the story doesn't end there. It continues. For when our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, came to this world for our sake, to save us, to pay our ransom, to be the light of the world, we beat him. We slapped him. We spit in his face. 
Now we check them. Think about that. In the analogy of the husband and the wife, it's as good as if the husband just sold everything he had, went to go save the girl, and then when he like pays her, pays the money or whatever, and the girl comes out, the first thing she does is slaps him. Think about that. And spits in his face and says, I'd rather, instead of being with you, I'd rather stay in the cage and be full of darkness. But yet the husband staying there saying, please stay with me instead. What kind of love is that? What kind of love is that? But the story doesn't end there. For we continued to crucify him. And he died on the cross. What I worry about is every time we say that Christ died for you and I, we don't truly understand what that truly entails. When we talk about the crucifixion of Christ, we don't truly understand what that means. The word excruciating comes from the word crucifixion. It's there to help us understand just how painful crucifixion was supposed to be. Of course, crucifixion was a capital punishment by the Romans. They were experts at what they did. They would spend time studying the body and Adam and ensuring that on the cross people did not die, but instead suffered. Crucifixion was a way to ensure the person would suffer to the point of death instead of dying right away. In the Roman culture, they had a law that said if you beat someone, you don't crucify him. If you crucify him, you don't beat him. They beat our Lord, our Savior, Jesus Christ, 6,666 times. Think about the pain. Each and every single time he was beat. Doing it for you and I to save us. What kind of love is this? It didn't stop there. He was told to carry the cross and take it all the way to Golubota. The cross weighs about 100 pounds, if not more. It's hot. He's already without any water. He's tired. He's just been beat. He's carrying the cross on his shoulders, walking to Golubota to save you and me. What kind of love is this? Then he gets into the mountain. And then it gets worse as he's put on the cross and they nail his feet and they pierce his hands. The reason why they do this is because when they nail his feet, his knees buckle and his body suffers and goes down and sacks down and his hands are pierced. So he's forced to pick himself up by the bitter's hands, which have a direct tendon connected to the brain that shoots an intense amount of pain through his body. Doing this for you and me. And as he picks himself up, his body sags, his knees buckle, and he falls again. And the cycles continued for hours. We're talking about a king. We're talking about the God of gods. We're talking about the Lord of Lords. Who did this for you and I? What kind of love is this? That one would lay down his own life for the sake of his friends. We are his friends. The one that spit on and beat him, crucified him. We are his friends. He called us brothers. I remember one time. I was having this conversation with someone, and she said, I just can't understand why God would do this. An all-powerful God would have to go through this just to save us. Why? To open the Garden of Eden? If he's all-powerful, why do you have to see what's open? I said, that's a good question. Imagine if your boyfriend sat down and told you all the time that he was going to buy you chocolates and flowers. Told you all the time, I'm going to buy you chocolates and flowers, chocolates and flowers. But he never does. 
with that Venus. Now, you wanted the chocolates. You wanted the flowers. He said, yeah, well, yeah. I said, what? Actions speak louder than words. She said. Exactly. God, the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, simply could have said, the Garden of Eden is over, come back. He said, I just, I want to show you just how much you mean to me. And I will come here. And I will show you through my death, through my crucifixion. This is the message of God. This is the seed that is used in the parable. So what will be our fruits? How will we respond? Surely, we can't turn our back on them. Surely, we can't simply say, it's good, but I'm not ready to sign up with Christ just yet. Surely, we're not going to get back into the cage that Christ has just saved us from. Surely, we will begin a new relationship with Christ. The appropriate response to the message that Christ has died for you is, I will give you my life. I don't know how I'm going to do it. It's going to be very hard. There's all these temptations in the world that might try to take me away. I might even fall from time to time. But I will be willing to try. All that Christ wants is our willingness. When we open up our hearts, when we get ready to accept Christ, when we accept Him and love Him and say, I will do whatever you tell me to do, I will walk in the path that you show me in, then Christ will take us the rest of the journey. He will carry us and take us into the journey. We don't have to worry about anything. All we have to do is willingness to say, I will give Him all of my heart. I won't hold back. I'm not going to be emotional about it. I'm not going to like hold back here and there and say, this part of my life you can't have. I will give you all my life. You have it. I will kneel before you and worship you until the day that I die. This is the appropriate response to the message that Christ has died for us. But this is only part of it. Because this, this will help you. But the true fruit lies in being able to help others. In the parable, we see how the seed is buried within the good soil. And the seed is able to produce, the good soil is able to produce multiple fruits. And these multiple fruits end up in the hands of multiple people. Multiple fruits end up in the hands of multiple people. Here today, you have heard the seed, the message of Christ, that Christ has died for you and me. That it's good if you change your life, but what you're expected to do is spread the gospel to multiple people around the world so they understand what the message is. Can we get honest for a second? Can we get real? The day of honesty. How many of you guys liked something today? Really, like, really liked it? I'm glad. I don't have any doubt. I pray that people in here will completely transform their life because of this message. Not because of anything I did, not anything that we did. Because of the message of Christ. It's so powerful. It has a chance to transform you if you open your, up your heart. There's no way you can walk away from a message that tells you about the love of God. There is no way you can turn your back on it. And I fully believe because of this message, people will transform their life. I have no doubt about it. But you know what? If more people were here, can we think about how many people could benefit from this message? The message of Christ? The message of the church? You know how rich our church is? Do you know how many things we have to offer to the rest of the world? Can I be honest? At the risk of setting my team members, this service was supposed to happen four months ago. This service. We didn't have enough people to help. 
measure of support. Simple things like setting up chairs. Like, look at these chairs that somebody knows. Tell me, sit down. Okay, teach you. I'm ready to go. Young people had to sacrifice their time, their energy, and everything to set up the chair. I didn't do anything. I kind of just walked in, said hi to people. I'm about to be. People had to set up like the whole, like the team meeting and all this. This is not easy to do. The seed doesn't become fruits overnight. Someone has to cultivate the soil. Someone has to come water it. Then the sun has to come up. Like so many things have to happen for a long period of time just to produce one fruit. To see one soul, one soul, we all have to come together and play our part. Our church is in a position where it's one of the best parts to be in right now. Through the grace of God, the church has been united. All this church politics is wrong. We don't have to worry about that anymore. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. This is the word of God, and I'm glad I live to see this good. No, it's up to us. We're at a critical point within our church history. We have a bunch of young people who just can't understand the language. That's not a sin. Not to understand the language. That is not a sin. And we all have some gifts that God has given us. Every time, like we ask, can you come and help us? Like, I can't do anything. I don't know. You know, when you say that, like when, when you ask, come and serve the church, come and help the church, come do this, and you say, I have nothing to do, you're not like saying something against you, you're saying against God. You're God's creation. You have a, God created you for the purpose to do something and to serve. So our job is to ensure this message reaches many, many people within our church. So here's the thing I'm going to give you guys a challenge. Dedicate just one hour of your time to helping the church, whatever the church means for you. If it's the YMTC, great. If it's not, great. It could be your own church, it could be where the church, whatever the church. Dedicate an hour of your time weekly. Remember, we're talking about the fruit, the response of Christ dying for you on the cross. Like if he can die for me, I can give him one hour of my time. One hour of my time we come, knock at the door, the administrator, the priest, whoever it might be, say, what can I do? If they tell you nothing, vacuum the carpets and go. They're not going to get mad for vacuuming. Don't you dare touch the carpets. No one's going to say that. Knock on the door next to me. What can I do? Nothing. So, like clean the bathroom, go home. This is serving your church. There is so much we can do if we come together. We can let the world hear the gospel. And people need to hear that we have something to offer. We shouldn't be ashamed of our faith. The world needs to hear about it. We have like something that can rescue the rest of the world. Come back to your church. Come back. The church is your mother waiting with open arms. Come. It will accept you. The Father is here. The church is the mother. So, if you have ears to hear, listen and understand. For Christ has died for you. Let's walk to the end.